instead of four. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce someone who is using ECS in production, um, Peter Wong from Travelex. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Peter Wong. I work at Travelex as Head of Engineering for Payments and B2B. So Travelex at a glance. Um, Travelex is the world leader in foreign exchange expert. We've been around for over 40 years. Um, we have, um, for, the, for those 40 years, we've built basically um, over a thousand retail stores across airports, um, uh, department stores, and we've also have oh, around 1,000 ATMs across. So we are handling lots of cash flow in terms of foreign exchanges. And that's the core business of Travelex. So here you see a little history of what's hap what has happened with the company. And so right about two years ago, um, we've been tasked to look at how we can actually deliver a lot more digital products for the company. And we're looking at how we can actually build a digital platform that can provide those capability. And here it comes to engineering and traffic. And particular remit we had was actually delivering international payments uh, for traffic. In fact, setting up a brand new business for traffic. Uh, we want to set up international payments, starting from going from UK outbound. And we want to be able to build B2C products and B2B products. In fact, hooking onto as many partners uh, as, we, as we can uh, onto a single platform. So we need to be able to deliver those capability securely and at scale. What does that mean, securely? Um, so some, some of you might think about security as end-to-end -end encryption. But actually, security has not just that. There are other things to consider. For example, um, compliance. So compliance is a set, separate topic from security, but we need to take that into account when we build an international payment system, uh, literally a bank, an online banking service. So that means we need to be compliant, say, with PCI. We need to be licensed uh, with, with the FCA in the UK to, to actually hold digital, uh, digital money for our customer. We also need to be able to resilient. We want, our, we want our services to be up 24 7 uh, with zero downtime, even when we're pushing changes to the production. So, what does that mean for us then in terms of engineering? What are our challenges? As I said, we want to be able to have encryption of all our data, and that's in flight and at rest. We want full auditability of everything we change, whether it's how we develop our features, how we push that features into our build, how we do release on, this, on, the, on that service, and how we deploy it, and how we actually operate it. We want complete auditability. We also want security for traffic coming in and going out of our, of our system. That is traffic coming in from our customer and for us to talk to our third parties as well. Obviously, as I said before, we want to be able to use it across product, across partners and customers. And this means we need multi-tenancy. We need to be able to support multi-tenants into on our platform. So Traffix has other digital products um, in, the, in the existing space. Um, they're not running on the platform, but we want to be able to make use of our capabilities so that we can actually use those capabilities across these platforms, so across these products. And of course, as I said before, we want to be able to make changes as regularly, as frequently as we can, because we want to deliver customer value as quickly and as effectively as we can. Hence, we want to, we were going through continuous deployment. We have to push changes daily if we want to. We want to push changes hourly if we want to. And as I said, 24-7 operations. So that means one of the things we turn into is actually, well, let's look at microservices. Why? First of all, microservices, as Abby said, is a single function. Does it work? It's a black box. You can you allow polyglot environments. It's composable, so you can actually take one or more of the services you already developed, put together, and there you go, you have a new product. You want to reduce risk. If you're, if you're trying to push changes continuously to an international payments platform that's handling money, 24/7, you want to reduce risk. And if I be able, if I can actually take a change, put change into an environment and say, well, actually, I'm actually pushing change to only very small part of independent service, that reduces risk, and that actually makes us get stuck quicker into the market. 
It also allows us to increase flexibility in development. If our developers comes in, or a new, a new engineer starts with our, with our team, he or she does not need to actually have to, have to know everything in the platform. They can focus on an individual service and actually start developing and adding value to the platform. In terms of operation, flexibility also allows us to say, in terms of security, we can, we can actually partition high risk versus low risk um, services and, and have different security posture between those services. And on top of that, we can scale up and down uh, our services independently, individually, as they are needed. So here is an example, uh, actually, what our, what our state looks like right now. We are adding more services as we speak. Um, these services are split between services required to onboard a customer, go through the relevant um, KYC checks, uh, AML checks, that, so that they can be our customers, so they can transact with us. Uh, our service is here to do with actual payments or when they're processing transaction, um, uh, looking at ethics rates, um, also looking at, looking at reconciliation settlement. And there are also these core services that actually is independent of payments, but are services that we need to communicate to our customers. For example, we have an SMS service that actually sends SMS. We have an email service, and guess what? It sends emails. So these services are very much on their own, loosely coupled, and they can be used across many products. So the microservices, we decided to do it this way, but we also want to do it based on some principles that we can actually continue evolving the, uh, the system. And what we decided to go for is looking at 12-factor um, app. What are 12-factor apps? So a 12-factor app is an app, a web app that has been developed uh, to follow 12 principles. These principles allow us to be easier to operate the app, easier to release changes to it, to scale, easier to monitor, easier to develop, easier to audit and to secure. So these are the these are the 12 factors on the on the slide, these are the 12, 12 factors that we need to consider. And I'm going to tell you how we deploy our services and operator in ECS, how that has helped us to actually fulfill um, a lot of these a lot of these principles um, quite out of the box. So in particular, because we chose to use microservices and choose to deploy them in Docker images, running them as Docker containers in ECS, meaning that our code base, we actually first control our Docker Compose file in source control. We use that to actually establish our audit trail. So every build, every change is actually audited, recorded in source control. And that means also because our because our deployment unit is the Docker image, all our dependency is actually encapsulated inside that Docker image. We don't need to actually think about our ECS, EC2 host, um, what, what else needs to be run inside the host. We actually deploy everything is into that image. And the important thing with that is, is the configuration that you can build around that in the forms of environment variables across multiple environments. So as I said, we have continuous deployment pipeline across, uh, across AWS, so we have three environments for testing, UAT and production, they're all running the same containers. The only difference is that the environment variables are different, so the configuration drives the difference, the, uh, the differentiation. At the same time, you can actually run the whole platform on someone's computer, if you want to, locally, offline. So I can actually run the platform on an airplane if I want to. And, that, and that's the power it gives us by actually setting up the architecture that way. So we using, by using this architecture, we also be able to audit, build, release, and run. And we can, we can do that to push images between across our environments. We use port binding uh, to actually allow us to run multiple, um, multiple instances, multiple Docker container into ECS hosts. And these, are, and, these, and these containers, because they are RESTful services actually, they are stateless. What does that mean? That means states, they don't contain states. The states are actually transferred onto our database. And that also means is that is these services are disposable. We have health, we use, we use the LB health checks to determine the healthiness of these containers. And so if they're not healthy because the host is not healthy, we can reprovision a, a new host, we can reprovision a new container, and it will be okay because they're stateless. And as I said, they have top parity. 
we can develop exactly the same thing as we run in production. So we are very close. The only difference is by a few configurations, such as our SQS Q names, for example. So these are the things that are coming now straight from it by actually running our state, our platform on ECS. There are other, as you can see, I've hi I haven't highlighted some of these, some of the principles, and some of these other principles we actually done by actually came out from the bottom up by design and architecture. So for example, backing surfaces. So our microservices are built using Java, and we use basically um, the SDK API. Uh, as a, first, as a first principle. So everything is on the API level. For example, let's take an example, queuing. What we do is synchronous messages across services, and we use JMS in, in, our, in our service. Now, we don't, we're not going to talk to SQS when we actually run our service locally. So what do we do? We use, we use ActiveMQ as, a, as an option, just for local development. That is fine, because our code is actually agnostic to, to which implementation we use. We just happen to be switching them under the hood. On top of it, it's still talking to JMS. So that's an example of how we treat our backing surface exactly the same way. And at the same time, the traffic going through from the surfaces to the backing surface are fully encrypted as well. And I'll take another example, logs. Um, logs is very important here. We have so many services running um, on e ECS, we actually use centralized logging. What, we've, what we actually use in our Docker, in our Docker logging driver is a CloudWatch log, uh, logging driver that allows us to send our logs from standard out all the way to CloudWatch directly without touching the host. And that means we are actually saving IOs and also means that we kept all our, our, all our logs eternally and it's using CloudWatch. And then we, when we're feeding that into Elasticsearch and we use Kibana to be able to visualize and analyze those logs. So here is a, a high-level high view of how we actually provision our services. As you can see, we use a number of AWS um, services. Um, we use cloud services like SESQ, SNS, SES, and S3 object, uh, object store. We also have um, CloudFront to use as our CDN, uh, with com um, coupled with our, our WAF, which defines our WAF rules um, to allow traffic coming in. We have a we, we use a, we have an API gateway in the form of an Nginx that allows us acting as a first proxy to allow us to actually to service the request and to decide on where that request will go, will go into our cluster to ECS cluster. As you can see, we also have um, using RDS as underneath it we use Postgres to actually host our transactional data. So here is just a little a more example of how we actually do end-to-end -end encryption. So if a customer, whether it's a, it's a, it's a new website, and that will be, also, will be fully encrypted, when a partner is actually using a TOS Mutual Auth, that goes into a public facing classic ELB, actually sitting on top of our Nginx cluster. So these traffic will flow through because they're layer 4, they don't actually have to decrypt at the ELB layer, they go straight into Nginx, that gets decrypted and re-encrypt using, using the key within, within, the, within Nginx. And then we actually do visual auth between um, our, our, our API gateway and our services. <coughs> and all our services are actually in a, pri in a private segment, so their ELB is private facing. And all our PKIs is managed by a uh, Haskell Vault, um, which we use actually as a service as well as a restful service. So every, everything in that cluster pretty much acts as a restful service. So let me give you an example of a service we have. Um, and then go through that flow in a bit more concretely. So we have a rate service that literally allows you to retrieve rate. Um, that rate could come from a database because we want it to be cash more indicative and more efficient. We want to minimize the number of hops. Or it could be talking to an internal system over a network. And then, in turn, and then as a business logic, we want to apply some, apply some, apply some logic to the business logic and then return back to the user. So if you look at our, if you look at our, our, our flow, basically a customer hits our website asking for a rate, it goes into CloudFront, and then that will direct that traffic into the public facing ELB to our Nginx gateway, and then that goes to the private ELB of that particular service, and hits our, hits our service uh, running as Docker, a Docker container as ECS. And then it talks to a third party. The third party, as I said, it could be it could be a database or it could be some something within another part, another another system outside in Amazon. 
And that's it, what I've got to say. Thank you.